Now, let me just add in a caveat here. Let, let me just add in something. What I am busy speaking about now, these principles that I'm speaking to, do not apply to a certain group of people. What I'm saying does not apply to the lazy. It does not apply to the apathetic. It does not apply to people who are blasé with the things of Jesus Christ. Um, it does not apply to those who by their apathetic demeanor make a mockery of the very high price that Jesus Christ paid for them. No, no, no. Uh, for those types of people, I've got a very different kind of message. No, the, the message that I'm speaking now is for those dear saints, those dear, dear brothers and sisters in Christ who distend the practice of their faith to unhealthy proportions. Uh, th those people who take their faith so seriously that their faith has become almost oppressive to them. Let me just tell you, there, there is a world of difference between excellence and perfectionism. There's a world of difference. And I've spent a lot more time breaking this down in other places. But you know, God doesn't expect us to be perfect. No. I mean, the Bible says that while we're still alive, while we still got breath, we're going to fall into sin. We're going to fall into brokenness at times. We're going to get tired. We're going to get discouraged. None of us is Superman or Superwoman. Big difference between perfectionism and excellence. Perfectionism is where you put a huge weight upon yourself. Or in fact, sometimes it's the devil that's put that weight upon you. And because of your good intentions, you've just allowed him to do it. And so there becomes this weight in your, in your faith afterwards where you're not praying enough, man. And so you, you just down yourself for that. And you're not meditating enough. And you're not reading the Bible enough. And, and you've missed that opportunity to go and tell that person and share the gospel with that person. And, and, you've, and the list goes on and on and on. We're always going to find things to beat ourselves up about when it comes to our faith. And the enemy has learned how to masterfully wield that sword. There's a big difference between perfectionism and excellence. Perfectionism is requiring the very best at all costs. The problem with perfectionism is that it does, doesn't stop with you. You're going to end up projecting those impossible standards on people around you, on your wife, on your spouse. Oh boy, are there people out there who have been married to a perfectionist in relationship with them? On your work colleagues? No. No. But what we are required to do is to operate with excellence. Perfectionism, demanding the very best at all costs. Excellence is doing the very best with what you have. And the beautiful thing about excellence is you come to realize what your limitations are. Yeah, sure, I would love to have been able to do it this way. But my resources, my connections can't do it. So can I tell you what I'm going to do? I'm going to do it this way. But I'm going to do it to the very best of my ability. Excellence is also going to uplift people around you. It's going to encourage people around you. Why? Well, sure, I, I can't do this in myself. So this now gets me to reach out to my neighbor, to show my neighbor that I appreciate them for their gifts and for their abilities, and to show them that I don't believe in the self-made man, self-made woman nonsense. No, I'm going to reach out to somebody and I'm going to allow them to operate with their gifting with me as well. Why? So that when it comes the end of the day, I'm not going to stand up and say, hey, I did this all in my own strength. I'm going to say, well, I did this, but I want to thank this, this brother or I want to thank this sister. Thank you so much for partnering with me and helping uh, to, to see this dream realized, this dream that is from God. So, so having said all of this, you know, it, it's actually quite understandable how a Christian could fall into that trap of perfectionism and, and how a son or a daughter of the Most High God would want to excel and do their very best. I, I mean, even Moses, the Bible tells us, fell into this trap. Do you remember? There was a time that Moses' father-in-law actually had to come and pay him a visit. And he said to, to Moses, he said, Moses, what you're doing is not good. Now, 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 now realize something. What, what the action that Moses was doing was needed and necessary at the time. He was, he was judging between the people and he was up early in the morning to late at night over and above all his other ministries that he was doing and, and his heart was for his people. His heart was to minister for his people. But he, even then Moses couldn't hear the Spirit of God saying, Moses cut it out. Why? Because Moses had so much noise and it wasn't only his noise, it was the noise of all the people that he had to judge. 
So God sent Moses' father-in-law Jethro to him to tell him, Moses, what you're doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out for this thing is too heavy for you. You're not able to do it alone. Moses, you're not able to do it alone. My brother, my sister, look at me. You're not able to do it alone. So here's my key. Yes, yes, what I'm getting at. You want to clutter or declutter. You want to get some of those thoughts out. You want to disentangle your thoughts so that you can receive and predispose and condition your mind to receive more readily from God. Here's what I'm telling you. Here it is. Lighten up. You're too heavy. You're, the demands that you've placed upon yourself, too much. The demands that those perfectionist people around you in your life have placed on you, too much. Give it back to them. If they can do a better job, let them do it. Too much. How much of the things that are weighing you down actually mean anything? Like I say, the Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. Time is short. If you've got another 10 years left, do you want to spend those 10 years on this part of eternity stressed out, freaked out? No. If you had another, what, what, if, you, what if it was another year? What if it was another week until Jesus came? Can I tell you, when I get to eternity, I thank God for eternity. Eternity, Pretty long time. But all of that eternity, when I think of my life on this side of eternity, I, I want to think of having the kind of demeanor, disposition in myself that God requires of me. Prayerful. Peaceful. Grateful. I want to be I want to be the kind of person that the lost and the saved can look to in these times. I don't want to be running around frantically with them. No, no, no. I want to stand up and make a difference. I come to realize that, knowing that I can't do it alone. You know, there were a bunch of people in the Bible that the Bible speaks about who had this art of perfectionism almost down to a T. Well, well, let me put it to you this way. What they projected on the outside was having this art of perfection and perfectionism down to a T. But you know what? Jesus called them whitewashed graves because on the outside, they looked like they had it together. But on the inside, oh boy, there was a mess going on there. Hey, So, so the, this group of people were called Pharisees. And Pharisees were a bunch of staunch believers. But, you know, something that I see about the Pharisees in the Bible is that they didn't impress Jesus very much. Why can't we learn from them? If we see this group of people that did perfectionism far better than we ever could, yet they didn't impress Jesus, why can't we learn from them? We, we don't need to be a bunch of New Testament, New Testament church Pharisees. No. And I also read in the Bible, that besides Paul, there was another Pharisee by the name of Nicodemus. These were the only two Pharisees, I think, that impressed Jesus to a certain degree. Paul, because he had a genuine conversion. Nicodemus, because Nicodemus, the Pharisee, came to Jesus alone one, one, one night. And he said to Jesus, he just had this heart's urge. And he came and he brought Jesus genuine questions he came and he he had he didn't try and question jesus to trap him like the other pharisees do, did no his inquiry was genuine he really was wrestling with some certain issues and it was to this pharisee nicodemus that jesus gave the most some of the most beautiful truths of christianity it was to this pharisee uh, nicodemus that jesus said unless one is born of water and of the spirit he cannot enter the kingdom of God. John 3 verse 5. Jesus also said to Nicodemus, you remember this beautiful one, this impact word? Now so many of us have got this memorized. How many of us realize that it was to a Pharisee that Jesus said these words? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Isn't that precious? was to a Pharisee, Nicodemus, John 3, verse 16. And then right on the heels of that, Jesus goes on to say these words, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world 
might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. So listen, when, when the devil, the great accuser, comes throwing all that perfectionism and all that nonsense your way, you say to him, whoever believes in him is not condemned. I am not condemned, devil. Take your accusation somewhere else. I am not interested in listening to those. I am a born again child of God most high. Can I tell you, Pharisees didn't impress Jesus. Can I tell you what impresses Jesus? When you're a son to him and when you're a daughter to him and when you walk humbly with him and when you show your trust for him. And that your focus is not on the entanglements of this world, but you've disentangled yourself from those things so that you can commune with your living Jesus and Savior. That's what impresses him. I think to myself of in Acts chapter 15, it tells us that there was a time that some Pharisees did actually join the New Testament church. But oh boy! What do we read about these Pharisees in the book of Acts chapter 15? No sooner had they joined the church. You know what they said? They started making demands on all the new converts. Yes, well, let them come into the church. But when they come into the church, they need to observe the law of Moses. Oh boy. Just been saved and they start falling into that trap. And I think of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8 verse 1. He says, there is now no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus. You know what I think Paul would do if he was sitting in that council in the book of Acts chapter 15. I believe Paul would allow righteous indignation to rise up in him and say no. Don't place those demands on them. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Back off of them. By the same token I think if Paul had to engage with some of our inner dialogue. When I say, oh, that's you and me, the ones that are striving to please God, please God. I believe that there would be times that Paul would say, no, back off from yourself, man. Cut yourself a break. Lighten up. You keep condemning yourself. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Lighten up. You see, Paul said to the Galatians, he said, are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Galatians 3 verse 3. When you're so tough on yourself, do you know what it is? You're not actually being humble. You're actually being prideful. Because when you're so tough on yourself, you, you, you're saying, well, I should be of the level where I could get it right. You know, Paul said elsewhere to the Galatians, Galatians 6 verse 3, he said, If anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. Do you know how heavy you get when you start loading these things upon yourself? Well, I didn't phone that brother today. I should have phoned him. Well, I didn't phone that sister. Oh, boy. You know, not to mention the three million other good things that you have done. Now you're beating yourself. Well, I didn't pray enough today. Oh, boy. You know, weighing, getting heavier and heavier. You're not light enough to receive a dream. All those things that you keep putting upon yourself are tripping you up. They're tangling you up. Stop loading these things on top of your back. You see, coming to know Jesus, coming to, to salvation, didn't make you perfect. It put you into training. It put you into training. And so while you're in training, there are times that you're going to stumble. But your faith walk should never be a source of heaviness or a source of condemnation. Your faith walk should always be a source of delight and joy in your Lord Jesus. It should be a source of inspiration. It be, should, should be something that really fills you with joy. Why? Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. If you're constantly miserable, you're weak. And we have a lot of weak Christians, not because of their circumstances, but because of the way that they view their circumstances. Their world view makes them weak. Oh boy. Is the enemy clever at weakening the ranks of Jesus Christ? No. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And so when you start filling yourself with these wonderful precious promises of God, not only is it going to change your worldview, it's going to change the way that you see yourself. Yes, we're going to mess up at times. 
But you know what? When we do mess up, God gave us the wonderful gifts of confession and repentance. So when we do, you know what? We don't allow our mistakes and our errors and our stumblings to separate us from God. We allow them to draw us closer than ever to God. Oh Lord, I missed it. You know, there, there was this brother. He, he really needed me to pray for him and I forgot to pray for him. There, there was this guy that we've just been walking with in our home group. He, he expected me to phone him and I forgot totally about it. I had such a heavy day. Oh God, even worse. Oh Lord, you know that sin? That sin that I've had victory over for the past three years, I've just, oh, I don't know what happened, Lord. Fell into it again. Take it to your Lord. You'll be surprised, these gifts of confession and repentance. I'm not talking about making a mockery of grace. I'm talking about when you truly, genuinely cut to your heart for your failings and you go to your Lord. You say, oh, you know that there's such a source of strengthening when you go to your Lord. There's such a source of, of be, have, having your, uh, a sense of having your head lifted. A sense of Him bringing you close and reinvigorating you. And cleaning you up. Putting you back on the path again. You know, there's, there's times though where your failings don't even have anything to do with your spiritual walk. Well, I suppose indirectly, but I'm saying... There are times when your failings have to do with, with failing as a parent. Oh boy, parent guilt, hey? You, you're trying your best, but you feel like you failed your child in this way or in that way. That, that project that you had to get finished and how your child has been missing his mommy or daddy. That, that ball game you were supposed to go to. That play you were supposed to go to. Oh, you think about it, your child was reaching out to you earlier today and you just dismissed them. You were so busy in front of the laptop and, and there they were demanding your attention and you just you snapped at them because, oh boy. Right? What about the way you fail as a spouse sometime? That precious person in your life that, that you were meant to love and to cherish and how you dismiss them. or hey, Snap at them too. Haven't, haven't been sensitive to their feelings. What about, what about you who have got elderly parents that have failed as a child towards your parents? And the list goes on and on and on. Here's my prayer for you. Here's my prayer for you. I pray that you belong to a true church that has got a true pastor and a true eldership team that, that are going to love you enough to invest in you to, to, to fix up those mistakes that you've made, to restore those relationships that you've erred in, perhaps even at times to mediate for you in certain relationships and to strengthen you and pray for you. And Listen, if, you've got, if you're in a true church with true pastors and true elders, I, I cannot begin to tell you how blessed you are and what a wonderful resource they are. Do, do you know that a true pastor in your life, the Bible says Ephesians 4, is actually a gift of Jesus Christ to you. So truly, a true pastor is God's gift to you. And, and these are people that are there to shepherd you and walk with you and to, and to nourish you and to pick you up and put your feet back on the path. If they're there, get with them and they will help you to restore you from these types of failings that I was talking about before. You're going to mess up. That, that's part of the human condition. And it's not the last time that it's going to happen. It just helps us to be sensitive and compassionate to other people who mess up as well, doesn't it? It helps us to think soberly about these people in these times. But, but never forget that there's another side to all of this as well. So, so you may have messed up. You may have messed up with your with your, your your child today but you know what there's other times that you're a great mommy there's other times that you're a great dad okay? so yeah your spouse saw a different side to you when you were tired and worn out and stressed and fatigued but you know what there's other times that you've been a great spouse you've been loving you've been considerate he or she didn't even know it but that time that time that you snuck through to the kitchen and washed the dishes for them he or she didn't even know about that sacrifice that you had to endure just so that you could bless them in some way or another. You've been a great spouse other times. As far as your parents go, here's the thing, here's the thing. They've been children themselves. They understand that there's times that you're going to mess up. They understand that 
there's times that you're trying to just make it in this world and 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 right now your priorities to your spouse and to your children and you've got three million other things weighing weighing in on your shoulders they understand what it's like because they've made the same mistake themselves so you say yes what pick up the phone give them a call just tell them you you love them and make it right you're gonna mess up because you're a human being we all mess up yes what i'm saying you mess up but lighten up lighten up why am i going on about lightening up with yourself stop being so heavy what does this have to do with the spiritual dreams and visions simple if you've got the wrong understanding about how god thinks about you if you think that he's a a heavy oppressive god judging you and expecting perfectionism from you you won't be able to recognize when he's speaking to you because you'll be waiting for the wrong god to speak to you if you want the true god to speak to you then you need to get a proper understanding of how the true god views you and he loves you he loves you enough to have sent the darling of heaven the rose of sharon our messiah our lord jesus christ yeshua our messiah he loves you enough to have sent him to die an agonizing death on the cross for you that ought to clear up some stuff that ought to disentangle some stuff right now god god wants to send light and life your way he doesn't want to send darkness and gloom in your dreams that, that's that's not dreams that's nightmares god wants to send light and life and if you want to see that light and life if you want to dream light and life then for goodness sakes lighten up i want to pray with you and then i'm going to dismiss you but let me pray and speak a blessing of the lord jesus christ upon you my heavenly father i am overjoyed when i'm reminded of how you delight in your sons and daughters oh god we can't even we we, we didn't don't even get a a small glimpse of how dearly you love us but god there are some people out there that need just that they need that glimpse because they need a fresh start they need to understand that you're not standing over them condemning them but they need a revelation that that our condemnation has been paid for in Christ Jesus. Oh God, I'm speaking to those people who are truly struck in their heart and every time that they fall. I'm speaking about those people that have truly strived so hard to please you, but they've, they've ended up trying to do it in their own strength and they've become so entangled in these condemnatory voices. They've become so distanced from the true affection that you have for them oh god would you just minister to them by your spirit right now would you just let them feel your deep love and affection just enveloping them i want to speak the anointing of the most high god upon them uh, upon them right now oh lord would you let them just go into a time of prayer right now just a time of being quiet where they can disentangle where they can hand those things over to you so that you can take care of those things, but so that their mind can be conditioned and predisposed to just receiving light and life in their dreams and visions. Father, if there's anybody that is not in re right relationship with you right now, I, I just want to pray that you continue to minister to them. If If you're listening to this and you don't know the jesus that i'm speaking about i, I just want to i have a sense of urgency to just tell you make it right with him pray to him right now say lord jesus i just want to give my heart to you i've messed up trying in my own way i want to give my heart to you i want to give my life and my future to you i confess you to be the risen resurrected lord and jesus and i know that you're, you're going to make that clear to me but i just want to confess it right now I give my heart to you just take my life and lead me and guide me and steer me for I ask this in Jesus name amen and amen just before I let you go I had a thought you know, the other day my little daughter Emma she came to me she said dad look at my picture and she had colored in the most beautiful picture six years old 
and I was delighted, man. I, I loved her choice of colors. It was happy. And you know, she's got a, ha a habit. Uh, sometimes <clears throat> when she colors in pictures, they're not sunny enough for her. So she'll draw a beautiful smiley sun with sunglasses up in a corner just to add her ray of sunshine. And I looked at this picture and I was delighted in this picture. It was so beautiful. You know, Emma turned around. And I said to her, it's beautiful, my darling. I love it. She said, yeah, dad. But you know, I... I colored out of the line sometimes. You know, I felt a sense of righteous indignation welling up inside of me. I mean, that was beautiful to me. No, my child, don't say that about what you've presented. I think it's beautiful. If I could do that for my daughter and even feel a sense of protection over what she gave me, how much more our Heavenly Father you know, you know, there's times where you feel like you've colored out of the lines with your heavenly father and you would point that out to God and God would, God, God would say, no, I love you. Don't worry. I'm the one who makes those lines fall in pleasant places. I can move the lines for you. But I'm delighted in what you've presented to me because it's you that gave it to me. Oh, brother and sister, be blessed. Can't wait to connect with you again. God bless you. Bye-bye.